Soil erosion. Illegal dumping. Deteriorating marine life. Poor water quality. Illness. These are some of the challenges facing the fragile ecosystems of the Caribbean islands. Challenges that, if unchecked, could do irreparable damage to our homes and livelihoods. Though complex and multifaceted, it's an issue that the Global Environment Facility has plunged into head first through a groundbreaking project integrating watershed and coastal areas management in Caribbean small island developing states, also known as the Jeff IWCAM project. It's a project that touches the heart of how we live in this tiny archipelago. After all, if you think about it, wherever you live, you live in a watershed, one of nature's most important waterways. This is the story of how ordinary people made changes to their ways of life to create extraordinary results, just as simple as turning on a tap. But to be crystal clear, we need to know what a watershed is. Watershed is simply a piece of land that is drained by a river and its tributaries. For example, if you stood at the, the mouth of a river as it enters the sea and you looked up the river, okay, you'll normally see a line of mountains that rings in the distance, okay? So that ridge line defines the limits or the boundaries of what we call the watershed. So the watershed is that space of land that carries all the water over the land and into the rivers that flows into the sea. From its inception, the Jeff IW CAM project sought to make participating countries more able to plan and manage their water and coastal resources and ecosystems more sustainably. This, of course, begins with what is done on land. You can say, for example, in a mountainous country like Dominica or St. Lucia, the watershed would extend from the high mountain area. So you have an upper watershed, we typically call it. The middle part of the watershed might be where you'd have farming taking place. You have the lower part of the watershed. That's where you start finding houses, buildings, roads, settlements, more farmland. That's where the watershed touches the coast. Way up in the upper watershed, you have land degradation in the form of deforestation. People typically would cut trees to make charcoal for timbers, boat building, extracting timber produce for other purposes. And we know once you have exposed lands, especially in these islands where you have relatively high rainfall, that leads immediately to soil erosion. That goes also into the middle parts of the watersheds where typically farming starts to take place. Once again, we have clearing for deforestation. So there's a direct impact for erosion when the land is left bare before the crops take root. Quite aside from that, you have agrochemicals. They overuse the fertilizer. You can get also weed control agents, other pesticides that itself pollutes. By the time you start getting down to the lower parts of the watershed, then when you get the houses and so on, well, people are throwing trash. People use septic tanks and so on. If these septic tanks are not built properly, they may be leaking untreated waste material you know, from your, your toilets and so on. All the water from your kitchen sink going into the rivers and the ravines and all that's being carried along. Or also you may have garages. Instead of properly containing the oil, they may throw the waste oil into a drain, it gets washed away. You will have lower down near the shoreline in the industrial areas, um, industrial effluence. Um, restaurants, if they don't properly contain their grease, that goes into the rivers as well. We have a big problem in a lot of the Caribbean islands with respect to um, waste from livestock farming, livestock rearing operations. So chicken farms, pig, pig farms and so on, you know, untreated effluent going into the rivers. By now it should be clear that what at first seems like isolated trends and events that have nothing to do with each other all actually pour into a complex mix of cause and effect. This is the challenge facing the region and the Jeff IWCAM project, helping people make the link between what they do high up on a mountain or near the banks of a river and the quality of water flowing into the sea. If you look at a river, you can see all kinds of things floating down. You can clearly see the river is brown. That's a clear indication that there's a lot of soil going down with it. You may see garbage going down. What you would not see are bacteria. 
in terms of coming out from the livestock facilities, if they do not have proper means to treat their waste, you'll find a lot of bacteria going in there. You have from households and so on that the septic systems are not necessarily working properly. You have also what we call a grey water from a kitchen sink. You have a lot of soap, what you call a phosphate, that gets into the, the water as well. You have from agriculture, the, the, the fertilizers and nitrates going in the water. These you can't see with your eye. What invariably happens is, once it gets into the shoreline, that causes algae to start breeding in the water. Algae is an aquatic plant and in a marine environment it can grow to such a volume it literally robs the marine waters of oxygen in certain areas. Not to mention other harmful toxics that gets into the water that can affect fish, it can affect your coral reefs. Not only that, but it degrees the quality of the water in which we bathe. So you find that river bathing, for example, is quite common in a lot of the islands. You can't imagine bathing in a river that's full of bacteria. Also, which is a big concern in many of the volcanic islands, where you find a lot of the sediment, you get so much sediment going into the river, it literally fills up the river bed. So where you'd find normally, if a river is healthy, you'd see a lot of stones and nice gravel areas and so on. You find what happens now, a lot of muck. All that soil mixed in with um, the, the chemicals and so on, settling at the bottom of the rivers. That has an influence in that. It starts to reduce the carrying capacity of the river for the normal water. So whereas a river might be deep enough, it could handle the flow during a heavy rain. Over many years, you'd find that the river literally now has become very shallow. So when it rains, now it floods. It floods, it washes away people's homes, it washes away livestock, it washes away all kinds of things. So this is how the project planners got started. They decided that the so-called top-down approach previously used in development projects would not affect the long-term sustained changes needed. So from the very beginning, they got into the heart of the communities most affected and who most likely needed to change their practices. And they listened. This was part of what is referred to as the triple bottom line approach, where an environmental project doesn't just focus on saving the environment, but on social, economic and environmental dimensions, the financial, social, domestic and even national impact of the work. The plan, therefore, was to have a series of demonstration projects across the Caribbean. These were designed, with a bit of tweaking, to find the best way of going about making the right changes as well as paying attention to the lessons learned so these practices could be replicated. The project's demonstration sites were in Antigua and Barbuda, the Bahamas on the islands of Exuma and Andros, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Jamaica, St. Kitts Nevis, St. Lucia and Trinidad and Tobago. Vincent Sweeney is the regional project coordinator and explains how the projects within these countries were chosen. The Global Environment Facility, which is the main funding agency for this project, is the largest fund for environmental projects in the world. They've disbursed millions of dollars, in fact probably billions of dollars, in funding for global environmental projects around the world, of which Ida Bicam is one of the beneficiaries. Um, countries, agencies, um, in some cases individuals would develop GEF projects, submit them to the GEF for funding. Most of the projects that are funded by the GEF are fairly substantial. The requirements for full implementation of a GEF project would be to prepare what's now referred to as a project identification form. Um, they review the proposal, would usually fund what's called a project preparation grant to allow elaboration of the project uh, and as a result of that grant a full-sized or medium-sized project would be submitted again to the GEF through its council and hopefully as a result of that submission um, funding would be made possible. The IDB Camp project was a five-year project which took perhaps even longer than five years from its conception to actual full-scale implementation and uh, that would be typical for, for a full-size project under the GEF. It is important to say here that the GEF IWCAM project, though already seemingly multifaceted, was part of a larger thrust, which included work at the regional level beyond the demonstration projects. Execution of this multidimensional project meant the involvement of several regional institutions and countries, each focusing upon solving specific problems or meeting particular needs. 
For example, the Caribbean Environmental Health Institute assessed the needs of regional and national laboratories in terms of both people and equipment to enable them to better provide water quality testing services in support of the IWCAM. The project was then able to provide needed training and equipment. UNEP's Regional Coordinating Unit worked with Haiti to sustainably manage watersheds through efforts such as reforestation, mangrove rehabilitation and other income-generating activities. In some places, however, the work was much more localized with integrated water resource management planning, creating a step-by-step -step roadmap to better water resource management. It's clear how much work has gone into making sure the project and its funding and partner agencies are not just the proverbial drop in the bucket, from SEHI or the Caribbean Environmental Health Institute to the farmer in Cuba. The Jeff IWCAM project and its relevant components have covered all the bases. So with the criteria in place and the project locations selected, it was time to get to work. While each demo project in the respective countries had its own success factors, a few stand out as fine examples. The inclusion of a wide cross-section of stakeholders and making community members responsible for the upkeep and outcomes of the project were found to be the best way to go about affecting real change. In Jamaica, the Drivers River Integrated Watershed and Coastal Areas Management Demo Project began like the meeting of several tributaries feeding purposefully into the sea. Not only were community members engaged on equal footing with other stakeholders, but several other partner agencies and even agencies formed because of the Jeff IWCAM project pulled out of harbour at the same time and with their eyes fixed on the same horizon. Errol Douglas is a technical team member of the Water Resources Authority who was involved in the project. For him and his colleagues, this demo project was a prime opportunity to begin monitoring water resources in the eastern part of the district, and they set about putting the structures in place to do just that. What we did basically was to assist in uh, procuring some equipment, um, which was uh, three water resources uh, monitoring gauges. One of the best things that happened on the project is that is, was our involvement with the local people, the, the local organizations, some of the, the private sector and government agencies. Similarly in St. Lucia, the first step taken to make sure all the relevant stakeholders were engaged was to identify and analyze those interest groups and individuals. They would later form the Watershed Management Committee, or the WMC. Trevelyn Clovis represented the community of Orléans on the WMC, which carried out the Jeff IWCAM project activities in the Fondor watershed. We were involved in organizing community-based meetings, organizing workshops, training programs, um, educational programs if the schools camp, and so on. The demo project in Tobago was a third example of how broad-based stakeholder inclusion from the project's inception saw both government and non-governmental organizations working in tandem. While the local community was engaged slightly later than in the previous two examples, the contribution of the Ants Fromager Ecological and Environmental Protection Organization in the Corland watershed was tremendously useful, especially in the dry season when wildfires are prevalent. Lyndon Glasgow is the president. What we try to do, especially with the young people, is try to educate them how to prevent you know, those fires and to talk to people who, you know, into it. You know, what has happened? What is happening is that what we're trying to do is to plant back trees which is what's been destroyed over the years because every year we face with bushfires, especially on the mountain sides. As we heard from Vincent Sweeney earlier, there's a process which must be followed in order for the demo projects to be selected and executed. But once that was done, it was clear that because of the stated intention to talk to community members from the beginning, their priorities guided the projects, even in ways they didn't originally anticipate. 
In Cuba, for example, in the community of Cienfuegos, farmers were concerned about the quantity and quality of their yield as soil erosion compromised their crops. Ramon Núñez Perez is the manager of the 42-hectare Sardui farm. A long time ago, this farm did not have any of this. Now we have contour curves to protect the soil. We have organic materials. We have the worm humus. It now has an irrigation system. The farm has progressed in the past, and with these improvements, it will continue progressing even better still. In Elizabeth Harbour, which is located on the island of Exuma in the Bahamas, the demo focused upon waste disposal from boating and marina activities. Concerns there revolved around the health of the marine life and how it impacted on their livelihoods. Jonathan Robinson is the owner and operator of the Dive Exuma Dive Shop. I've been diving a long time, just for all my life. And for my first start diving, the reef, you know, you can see the difference. You can see the time after time with them. Um, like back then, the reef was like, you know, so blooming, so colorful, so lively. You, when you, when you, when you dive, you'd want to dive again, you know. But now you don't get that more, much excitement, excitement, you know, when diving with it. Yeah. Basil Minns, a fisherman and boat owner, has also observed the alarming decline in the quality of sea life in the harbour. You couldn't fish it on a commercial scale, I don't think, because there wasn't sufficient fish for that, but it surely provided enough fish for local consumption. Um, you could go out and get a meal whenever you wanted to, and um, they, you know, there would be snappers and grunts and margaret fish and other for fish like that. Conch, of course, there's some conch beds in the harbour that just disappeared, overfishing and um, I guess perhaps some pollution or what have you. So we've lost quite a few of the coral heads and um, some of the seagrass beds, of course, have been destroyed by the amount of uh, boats we have today. In St Lucia, the priorities for the communities in the demonstration site focused more on the issue of waste disposal and management. This problem originated in what could be referred to as the middle of the watershed. The man on the ground is Ananias Vernai. Almost 15% of the people do not use pit latrine, neither flush toilets. And in addition to that, some of the communal um, toilet systems were closed down or not functioning. So you find that this 15% of the population within the Olia community use the bush to, to, re to release the feces. What's interesting about St. Lucia is that the rainwater harvesting project, which featured prominently, was not initially an IWCAM priority. But the managers realized that generating interest meant listening to what was most important to the community and putting it on the front burner. And that was the chronic shortage of water. So the rainwater harvesting sub-project became a highlight of the Jeff IWCAM demo project in the Fondor area. As the issues most important to the demo communities began to emerge, so too did the relationships and partnerships that were needed to address them. At times, the way forward needed to be adapted to reflect a shift in circumstance or an unforeseen reality, but the partnerships built and maintained during the demo projects and beyond were a solid base for the work that was done. Among the most notable partnerships were those in Tobago with the non-governmental organization the Buco Reef Trust, which implemented the Jeff IWCAM project, and in St. Lucia with the now incorporated Trust for the Management of Rivers. The National Intersectorial Committee was made up of individuals from the NGO sector and from Tobago, the Env Environment Tobago, from the state in Tobago, the THA, primarily the Department of Natural Resources and the Environment. And on the Trinidad end, we had town and country planning, we had Water and Sewage Authority, we also had a Ministry of Environment, as well as folks from, or representatives from the Institute of Marine Affairs and the Environmental Management Agency. In fact, the initial meeting, they were quite engaging, and I think at the technical level, 
the intersectoral committee was able to engage each other to share responsibility in terms of what was expected of them. But the greatest challenges I think we had at that level was how to move from there up the chain. Because, like I said before, the organization, the NGO, that is the Book Reef Trust, being the only NGO to execute a national project, and this being a precedent, it was on tried waters. Every project has a life cycle. Upon the completion of the Jeff IW Camp project, we realized that we needed some sort of sustainability and a means of capturing the lessons learned from the project. Therefore, it was decided among the members of the WMC that we should evolve into an NGO. So that is how the idea of the Trust for the Management of Rivers came about. Now that all the people needed to execute the projects were in place and clear on what they were required to do, it was time to cast a wider net and educate the public on why this work was even necessary. This not only created a wider base of support for the project, but it began the gradual change in thinking that would inform better sustainable environmental practices, which future generations would benefit from. And where better to start an education and public awareness drive than in schools? The Buko Reef Trust initiative called Sun, Sea and Science was a popular school vacation program which included watershed hikes, wetland field trips and introductory training in scuba diving. It's this particular activity that triggered a possible career choice for 17-year-old Christopher Henry from Golden Lane. I participated in the tree planting program. Well, I learned a lot about the reef and the effects that the land have on the sea. And, well, we had a lot of fun, I could say, in general. And... It was a great experience. I was interested in the diving because, you know, my aim is to be a, you know, a welder, offshore welder, and I think the diving will give me a great advantage. But the educational aspect of the Jeff IW Cam Demo Project in Tobago wasn't all field trips and scuba diving. At the primary level, an entire syllabus was created around the tenets of land use practices which impact upon the reef. The approach was um, we had a lesson plan, right, or a package, an education package, consisting of several lesson plans that we would have taken to the students, physically gone to the school and interface with the, the students, um, delivering these lesson plans. Most of the, the plans would um, treat with the topics, uh, coral reefs, mangroves, um, forests, that sort of thing. Water, water everywhere, water all around, water in the ocean, water in the ground, water in a river, water in a creek, water in a faucet with a drip, drip, creek. At this point, the projects had got off the ground, the communities had been mobilized, and the wider public had begun to benefit from the public awareness and education campaigns. It was now time to stop the practices that were putting stress on the environment and reverse the habits that were having long-term trickle-down effects. The most effective aspect of this approach was having communities design and be trained in the processes that would do this in a way that could be duplicated in other communities and by those who would inevitably carry the project forward. As we heard from Ananias Bernay earlier, the treatment of wastewater in some demo project communities was one of the main headaches for those areas. We have earlier been a very rocky um, um, mountainous area the substrate has very little soil, the soil profile is very shallow, and it does not allow people to construct a suckerway. There's no room, there's no soil to absorb the water. So we found that most people in the area 
release the, water, the, the black water from the toilet tank directly into a gutter, into a drain, or that, and that water flows in all directions. And most, more often than not, it leads into the river, and that's where the, the, a lot of the pollution um, um, emanates from. Recognizing that problem, we decided to look at different types of possibilities of addressing the problem to develop a demo that would be useful to the community so that we can be, be able to alleviate the problems that we have in the river, the, the, the bacteria loading the water. So we consulted the University of Vermont and they provided us with technical support. But we had to design the system in an appropriate way that would suit our environment. It's hard to tell where the issue of erosion ends and the wastewater treatment begins. Another example of how interconnected watershed management is and why it was so vital that the project could be replicated. As such, the construction of the artificial wetlands hinged on the ability of those involved to get raw materials quickly and easily, and it didn't take a whole lot of technical expertise to execute. In, within the structure, there are components where you can clean the system, there are components where you can flush the system, and on top of the, the, the top layer of that, uh, that wetland, we have a number of plants. Um, it's, a, 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 it's a plant from the ginger family, ginger bissier family. And we utilize that plant since it's very succulent, the root system is not very hard, that, may, that can interfere with the structure. So we, we, we were able to identify a plant that can grow in that type of environment, uh, um, kind of saturated to semi-saturated environment, and can absorb that type of um, polluted water. What we have not yet said, but what this project also made clear, was that the ability to generate income by improving environmental practices was not lost on the communities involved. Lisa Kirkland, demo project manager of the Drivers River watershed of Jamaica, puts all of it into perspective. One other thing for me personally is to see the change in culture, the way of life of the community persons. I remember in particular farmers training day, farmers came to me and say, you know, I used to plant it in this particular way, but I didn't understand it your way. No, your way is the best way. And for me, that was a huge thing because these are like older farmers and you know they stick to things when they have it and for me the old training of the community bringing them from a level not knowing what a watershed not knowing um what is the importance of pollution having done community monitoring where the community literally collected the samples you have gone to a doctor you have done your blood test now you're ready for the results so we have what you call a town meeting where everybody sat in the square we have a pot of soup and Everybody come to hear what are the results and people came together to um, give us solution that they would be implementing. We were really facilitating their ideas. As Lisa explained, it's no easy thing to change the mindset of persons who have been doing things a certain way all their lives. But when shown how to make the best use of the land they already worked, members of the Hector's River Jamaica Agricultural Society group turned their June plums and breadfruits into cash. We, plant, we, we went into the tree planting project. I am the one who steered the group by the spending of the cash, the purchasing of the trees, rather trained us how to do pruning, different kind of planting. We got trees like June plums, mangoes, East Indian mangoes, sour sap, breadfruit, and other things, other plants. We are now reaping from our June plums. We had two types of plum, the tall variety and the mini plums. The mini plums are plums that bear right along the year. We can reap plums all through the year. But the tall variety bears one sperm year. With the June plums and the breadfruits that we got, I went ahead and made breadfruit wine. I made June plum wine, pineapple wine, and all the fruits are around anytime they are in season. It's worth repeating that while the environmental imperative is one motivator, 
helping people earn income so they can improve their quality of life is a key selling point. It makes the connection between watershed protection in rural communities, employment opportunities and making money from the protection and sustaining of scarce or endangered natural resources. And nowhere was this more effectively done than in the Ferry Hill community in the Drivers River watershed. Through a small grant program, people in the community started a business making paper products out of recycled paper and breadfruit paste. This is the latest now, the books from journals, um, notebooks, which we don't have now, they have been sold out, notebooks, little ones. We have albums, which people love very much. And we also have um, gift boxes of six envelopes and six notelets. Lovely gifts for anyone. We have lovely greeting cards for whatever occasion. Okay, and we have also greeting or thank you cards. We have even bookmarks. It must be noted here that while the nine demo projects in eight countries are featured in our story, the Jeff IWCAM project included 13 countries in all. Dr. Christopher Cox from Sehi notes that in some of the islands, the Jeff IWCAM project was often an improvement on sustainable habits that communities had started themselves. We have had, for example, in, um, in Union Island, in the Grenadines, right, and in Karyaku, also in the Grenadines, where the people there, when we went across to those, those islands, they indicated that they're very water stressed. The Grenadines, there are no running rivers. People catch water from the rain that falls on the roof. And they had some, already some, some infrastructure. They had some, what they call these community catchments. Basically hillsides that they've paved in concrete. When the rain falls on these paved hillsides, it goes into a big concrete tank, a community catchment. And then the communities come along there and they take their water. What the project was able to do, what it, it was able to actually refurbish some of those, put those back into operation so that they don't leak as much and so on. And the communities have shown um, you know, a great amount of appreciation for those kind of um, actions. So you've had a range of different actions, all right, where people's, people's education has been improved, um, the, the capacity has been built, the professionals know a bit better about what they need to do, skills have been imparted, we've, you know, we've had the governance structures improved, for example, the institutional arrangements, and we've actually had things on the ground, actual improvements on the ground. <laughs> The community involvement in the project and the wider benefit to their respective countries is far more likely to be sustained if governments get on board and support it. For the Jeff IWCAM project, this has been another success. Cornelius Isaac, project manager for the demo site in St. Lucia. A lot of the things that we achieved could not have been done without, you know, the not just the, the moral support but the material support from government. It's a project where we undertook activities costing twice what the project funds were, you know. The rest came either directly or indirectly from government. It's true we got the lessons, but if it's not reflected or translated into policy, you know, which frontline ministries have to adopt and implement, then, you know, there's a limit to what you know, can be done. We are thankful that the government was, was able to, to accept at least two of our um, policy advisories. The political momentum has also taken hold at the regional level, as Vincent Sweeney explains. And this consortium actually came out of uh, the efforts in the region among many of these organizations to actually work closer together in one particular area, which is the integrated water resources management. And uh, the project has been instrumental in establishing, at the time, what was called an informal working group on, on integrated water resources management, or IWRM, which e over time evolved based on the, su the, su the success of that grouping into what is now uh, a regional mandate from the CARICOM ministers to to work together and under the umbrella of a consortium. This is not to say that the legislation governing the protection of watershed and coastal areas in every country in the region is uniform. Neither is enough attention paid to the regulations to monitor and manage the effective implementation of these pieces of legislation. 
For example, in St. Kitts and Nevis, there are over five separate statutes with various functions for water resource management, and the legislative framework has many critical gaps. There are no formal water quality standards requirements, and there is also no provision in the law for trade or sewage discharge licenses, and no effluent discharge standards to monitor these. In stark contrast is Jamaica, where there are pieces of legislation covering water quality, solid waste management, agricultural practices, and the coastal marine environment. There are also agencies in power to act, as well as regulations which empower local communities through their respective parish councils to participate in decision-making about development and activities within their respective communities. The legislative framework for Cuba appears to be comprehensive and well-suited to address the IWCAM approach. The existing legislation and policies provide for areas of priority, such as pollution, public health, coastal area management, land use, watershed, and environmental conservation. Demo project manager in Cienfuegos, Alain Munoz Caravaca, explains how government support has been instrumental in getting the project started and keeping it going. The Cuban government's contribution to the project is primarily the political will and will of every kind to guarantee that the worthy endeavor to achieve a goal, one shared by the Jeff IWCAM and government alike, is implemented. That the watersheds and coastal areas are put to their optimal use and to ensure better service to society, making sure that all of the country's infrastructure is available to support the project to achieve that common goal has been a significant contribution. Undoubtedly, the human factor has been also. Having a human resource prepared to radically change its way of thinking in line with achieving a correct management plan for watersheds, one that simply brings about that benefit which, as an environment and as a natural resource, it can give to society. But as with many projects of this nature, often the private and public sector need to work together for successful implementation. There may at times be competing or conflicting interests among these two groups, but if there is a common purpose and focus, sustainable long-term results can still be achieved. Nowhere was the success of this partnership more evident than in the Dominican Republic. Not only did the collaboration and partnership work for the Jeff IW CAM project itself, but it is a direct indication of how the project can be sustained and replicated beyond the initial funding period. Flavio Rodriguez is the president of the Association of Industry and Business in Haina, which serves as a link between the industrial members and the government and gets both sides involved. The association's basic objectives are the development of its members, as well as the development of the environment in which we perform our activities, both commercial and industrial. The association, as its name says, is a grouping of both industrial plants and commercial enterprises. It comprises not only the manufacturing sector of Zona de Haina, but there are also association members who are businesses and manufacturers from all around the San Cristobal region. We are approximately 65 members. We bring together more than 20,000 jobs. And we've been an established organization since 1981, so we already have practically 32 years of experience. The 20,000 workers represented by the association not only understand the vital link between productivity and sustainable environmental practices, but have adjusted their practices and received the relevant training to make it a reality. As has been demonstrated earlier, buy-in at the community level also played an important part in the private-public collaboration. Among project partners were the Haina Neighbourhood Councils, which stressed the needs of the various dwelling communities in the areas and several schools. Students at a local school were involved in the cleaning and maintenance of a park in Santo Domingo.
Participation in the IWCAM project is collective. It's a joint effort through my various teammates who are also custodians. They're caretakers. Together, we look after the environment. Along with other particular group leaders, they help me in safeguarding the environment, in taking care of it, in motivating people so they too can look after the environment with us, because they're not aware of the harm they're doing to it by throwing a piece of refuse on the ground. Consequently, we're dedicating ourselves to enlightening people, so they become more aware of the damage they cause unknowingly. It is clear the message of environmental responsibility got through to the students involved in the project, but a direct line from that kind of buy-in to the collaboration between the public and private sector can be drawn. This will ensure that Hiraima's dream of improved environmental responsibility for generations to come is fulfilled. The IWCAM project has facilitated the interaction and development of synergies between what is the public sector and the private sector, with input from the industries located in the Haina River's lower basin. In this way, the Ministry of the Environment has been able to create a project geared towards environmental protection in which the manufacturing sector has had an important role with exceptional participation and very active support for the IWCAM project. The project's activities can be replicated in other important geographical basins in the country. In fact, the Ministry of the Environment is already set to develop these practices and activities in the Iguamo River watershed in the east of the country. And in fact, all of these pilot projects for cleaner production will be duplicated in the Iguamo River Basin. While we have already seen how, including and consulting the communities who worked in and benefited from the project was central to its success, there still needed to be some structure within which they could work. In addition, the local governments, which in some islands was already in place, and in others where it evolved, it provided a way to monitor and analyze ongoing results. One who knows all about the importance of good local governance is Ray Sandy. He's administrator with the Division of Infrastructure and Public Utilities of the Tobago House of Assembly and a partner with the Jeff IW Cam project. We have a responsibility for infrastructure development in Tobago and the Book of Trust would have um, approached us with respect to assisting them with this um, particular project. We are also aware of the um, importance of the marine environment to Tobago's economy and we recognize that uh, the marine env environment was being negatively affected by the uh, the effluent runoff and so on from um, man-made activities on the island and give more responsibility for infrastructure development that includes uh, and also uh, public utilities that includes sewer treatment. We thought that we get involved in, um, in this project to assist with the basically the cleaning up of the marine environment that will certainly benefit the, um, the reef areas. We introduced some, te some, some technology we've introduced into Tobago that we did not have before. And, um, and we are pretty, um, pretty happy to be a partner with that um, kind of technology. We basically um, provided the local resources to um, ensure that the plant that was putting at, um, at Jacob's um, fish processing plant was, was, um, was put in. So our, our responsibility really was the infrastructure development to ensure that the project worked the way it's out of to, work. Perhaps one of the best examples of good local governance was in Jamaica. The National Environment and Planning Agency, or NEPA, as the implementing body for the Jeff I.W. Cam project in East Portland, had institutional links to the Parish Council, as well as the Portland Environmental Protection Association, PEPA. The structure of NEPA for project implementation created the environment for ongoing involvement by all interested parties. In addition, in trying to achieve what the project set out to do, five program components managed by distinct subcommittees were developed and executed. So what were the key lessons coming out of this process? Quite simply, that ordinary people need practical solutions to long-term problems that affect their livelihoods. Solutions that run in a clearly defined line from the problems. The key here is their buy-in and input every step of the way. 
The Jeff IWCAM project, while over in its initial funding phase, will live on in the lives of the people in the communities it affected the most. They feel it is their project, their watersheds, their livelihoods, and their children whose lives will be better for the change in thinking and behaviour. We could give you a list of improved water quality readings, pictures of clear flowing rivers where once there was silt, rubbish and toxic sediment. Some of these things are already evident. Others will take considerable time and sustained effort to become a reality. A more integrated approach to watershed and coastal areas management will not happen overnight, but meaningful progress is being made. We'll let the true stars of the show tell you one last time what the Jeff IWCAM project meant to them. Based on the level of um, interest within the communities and the knowledge that we got from the project, this project will always continue. In terms of the implementation of activities, it has been completed. But I think in terms of the lessons learned, you're still seeing the benefits of those. And you're still seeing them taking root, not just um, spreading to other communities, but in the communities themselves. Right now, I have changed. Things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. And it's like I appreciate the environment even more. And I encourage others to do the same.